So I travelled around the world and I was, uh, I'd grown up in, on a fruit farm in New Zealand. So I sort of had a bit of horticulture in my background and bumped into a goat, <laughs> my goat called Emily. Every day I would take her out on a long rope, bang the stake in the ground and she would have 50 yards of hedge, Cornish hedge to roam around. And I began to notice that she wasn't hoovering up the herbage, she was actually picking very selectively the plants. She seemed to be really making intelligent decisions. She was choosing from a, a materia medica because all the plants she was using were medicinal. Wow. And then I realized that she was fine tuning her inner being, her inner metabolism through her nose and instinctively organizing her affairs just by her innate intelligence. And I made a decision then, Emily, I would like to be like you when I grow up. That's incredible. She's been my teacher. Uh, Ginger, I mean, you know, just step back a bit. It has been the most valuable commodity in human history. And you know what? It was made extinct in the wild 2,000 years ago. All the ginger we've had since has had to be grown by rootstock because it's lost the capacity to live in the wild. And that's human. We were doing ecocide two, gen two millennia ago. Doctor's Kitchen. Recipes, health, lifestyle. Simon, thanks so much for joining me on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. This is such a treat. I, this is a treat. I get to learn about herbalism from an expert who's been, you know, in this field for decades. I, I'll be honest, I'm very new to the field. I, I had a conversation with um, Alex Laird a number of years ago, who's, I'm gathering you know her. Very well. Yeah, yeah. She was wonderful. She's great. We, we, we were in my studio. This is pre-pandemic. We cooked a lovely meal together using lots of different herbs and we just had a conversation. It was great. So that was my introduction. And now I guess this is uh, moving on a bit, I think, in terms of like your experience. So tell, tell me a bit about how you got into this field. Uh, I started out as a medical scientist, uh, I did the degree at Cambridge, and but what, I never thought I was going to be a doctor. I thought I might do some research or some other. Uh, and then I travelled uh, as one did in those days. You didn't have to go straight into a job. We were, yeah. we were baby boomers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so I travelled around the world. And I was, uh, I'd grown up in, on a fruit farm in New Zealand. So I sort of had a bit of horticulture in my background, a bit of plants. And I was travelling around in North Africa and Central America and staying in places where I could see people treating themselves with traditional remedies. And they're all plants. And that sparked a few thoughts in my mind. And I came back and then ran a small holding in Cornwall and um, bumped into a goat, my goat, called Emily. Uh -huh. um, she was a, the, the she-goat. She had ran the whole brood. But every day I would take her out on a long rope bang the stake in the ground and she would have 50 yards of hedge, Cornish hedge to roam around. And I began to notice that she wasn't hoovering up the herbage. She was actually picking very selectively the plants. And she seemed to be really making intelligent decisions and no one had taught her anything. You know, she couldn't read a book. Uh, and I was began to watch and there was already, and I, this is a herb nursery we were okay. running there. Yeah. So uh, uh, someone had told me about growing herbs and I thought this was probably more fun than lettuces. So there we had the herbs in the pots, um, watching Emily choosing the plants very carefully. And it's only later, of course, I realized that she was choosing from a, a materia medica because all the plants she was using were medicinal. Wow. And then I realized that she was fine tuning her inner being, her inner metabolism through her nose and instinctively organizing her affairs just by her innate intelligence. And I made a decision then, Emily, I would like to be like you when I grow up. That's incredible. She's been my teacher. That's incredible. And then I discovered that there's a herbal medicine program in, uh, it used to be Leicester in those days. So I went and studied, and because I'd done medical sciences, I sort of shot through quite yeah. fast. And then they saw me coming and began to put me in charge of things. And so I was around, A, as herbal medicine emerged out of the post-war doom, gloom, and then complementary medicine came along. And I happened to be in a room in late 1970s with a guy called Stephen Fulder and a couple of other people looking at a report he'd written on alternative medicine. And he said, we've got to have a different word than alternative. 
kind of supplementary to medicine because that's you know doctor deferral stuff. Why don't we call it complementary medicine? And that was the birth of what we now call CAM. So I was at the beginning of that. I was the first chair of the Council of Complementary Alternative Medicine in the early 80s. And then we set up a university program in Exeter in the mid-1980s on the back of some conversations that we had at the Royal Society of Medicine. And they persuaded the university authorities that this was worth studying. And then we set up this research and education program there. And then one thing led to another. But... Throughout, I've been a practitioner. I've, I'm 45 years now seeing patients. Wow. Wow. That's so, incredible. Been just last man standing is probably the way <laughs> you would describe me. <laughs> been around too long. Yeah. So, so, so tell us a bit about the education piece. Uh, what, what do you exactly learn when you go and do the course on herbalism? And how close are you to being like Emily? Ah, uh, no, that's a difficult question, isn't it? Yeah. You can't, Emily never read a book, so let's oh, yeah, yeah. let's come to Emily later. Uh-huh. So the current herbal medicine programs, and there's many of them, and they've changed a lot. I mean, the one I went on had been uh, developed in the 1920s, and the, the, the staples had rusted through the paper, you know. I mean, it was really qu- quite embarrassing. Um, so one of our jobs, and I was working with a colleague, Heinz Elstra, and we set up the School of Herbal Medicine that in the late 1970s, and that sort of developed a, a more science-based, medical, recognizable, with a lot of botany and other sciences in as well. Great fun. Mm. Uh, and that, led a, that was a template for future herbal medicine programs. There was uh, Middlesex and various other universities picked up that, London, Westminster. Uh, and so for a while, and uh, herbal medicine has now been a, almost like a, a no, another health sciences program. Where you learn your Emily skills is, I don't think, on the program. Uh-huh. And that's when you get your, you know, your feel for it. Yeah. Uh, and uh, your gut starts coming in on the, on, on the scene. And uh, most herbal students are too f- uh, full of st- data and it probably takes a few years to settle into the Emily mode Mm, Uh, but as you get older and this is running taking running forward increasingly I practice like Emily and so when I see a patient and I spend an hour or so with them and get the plan organized and I'm a physiologist primarily so I'm interested in how systems link up so they come in with arthritis but they walk out with something that's completely new and different Everyone gets something different. And I put together something and, you know, I've been around too long. I don't want to wait three months for something to happen. So I'll ask them to taste it first. And these are strong. So the first thing is to watch their face. Holy hell, you know, I never knew this is, this is herbs. <laughs> <laughs> so you wax them, Emily, you see. Um, and then I say, ring me tomorrow and let me know how things are going because things can work really fast. It, it sets off things down here. Uh, I, I use the term acupharmacology. So I'm operating on receptors and signals in the gut. And the gut is wired up in all sorts of wonderful ways, as you know, uh, with the rest of the body. And so we can see changes literally overnight. Yeah. Within medicine, we have the same problem, I think. The ability to separate out the placebo effects and the, the pharmacological effects. And I'm very open-minded. I'm I'm of the opinion, you know, if something works and the patient's having a great uh, outcome from it, that's that's the way forward. How do we deal with this conundrum of giving someone a substrate, whether it be inert or something that clearly has a lot of powerful value, uh, whether it's a, a, a botanical, whether it's a herb, whether it's a, a supplement, from the the, the the very powerful placebo effect? I would turn that question right on its head. Uh, I sat on a beach once in Greece uh, reading a paper about the placebo effect, particularly in pain, and the calculation that in some situations placebo can account for 80% of the observed phenomena. Mm-hmm. And so first of all, my confidence went down the tubes. I said, why am I teaching people four or five years to do something with placebo can do even better? <laughs> yeah. And then I realized it turned it the wrong way around because placebo is simply the self-healing, correcting phenomenon. And it doesn't take much nudging. 
And then I realized that's what we were doing. We're nudging self-correction. And I sat on that beach and said, you know what? I want to get better placebos to find ways of breaking a, a, a slight blockage that, you know, a blank placebo, let's say, might not break through. So I very much see the herbs at their most powerful, which is why it so be so quick, as I call it nudging. Mm -hmm. It just knocks the door a bit and just gets something moving. And then the rest is placebo. And everything we do is placebo if you turn it that way around. So a pharmaceutical that has a receptor effect can overcome placebo in a head-to-head -head competition. But, you know, as honest doctors will admit, the pharmaceutical doesn't heal. It'll break down a door somewhere, but the healing is what happens afterwards. And that's the business that I think I want to be in. I want to be in how to help the body to find its own innate healing capacity. Yeah. In the hierarchy of all the different interventions that one has available to them, so you have diet, you have uh, mind therapies, uh, you have exercise, you have a whole suite of different elements, and then you have you know, pharmaceutical supplements, herbs. Where, where do you see it fitting? And like you you said, you know, nudging the door open and stuff, is it is it purely a nodule? Can it actually have those... You know, there's, there's genuine therapeutic values. Oh, definitely. There is, uh, there's a lot of evidence to show that plants do cover the gamut, the whole spectrum, from um, foods on the one hand, which is where we start, uh, and we'll come back to uh, today. I'm going to talk with great enthusiasm about how we can add value to our foods simply and cheaply. Uh, right through to things like digitalis, you know, which is foxglove, for heaven's sake. Um, and so some of the but the, the, the strongest remedies are plant-based or originally come from plants. Um, you know, opium, forget, you know, you know you can't, you can't say no more. Uh, so there is a spectrum. And, you know, particularly when we talk about self-care and looking after ourselves, because we always focus on the gentler versions. But as you get increasingly uh, pr uh, practice proficient, you can inc use some of the stronger ones to break a stronger door yeah. if you like yeah yeah, yeah. Well, well let's look at some of the different cultures that have introduced herbal medicine so i mean i i'm uh, from an indian background so i better is sort of the oldest of the lot probably yeah yeah it's, it's definitely been a guiding thread throughout my whole life you know the use of turmeric and ginger and all the rest of it um but there are a number of other cultures that use different things where whereabouts were you traveling when you when you went away uh, north africa and so that's islamic okay and then central america which is a combination of indigenous uh, american and spanish okay. traditions okay um and so you had this and and it's, it's often a blend mm. uh we put together a an, an, an ethno map once of the world and there there's a couple of three main centers of independently uh, springing up cultures. Ayurveda is the oldest, India, China close behind, and then what we call Galenic, the European tradition, and they blend in the middle with the uh, Urdu, you know, in the Pakistani world, which is essentially Galenic, uh, and Islamic is Galenic. Um, but then you see the overlaps, and particularly when you talk about North America, you get the translation over the Atlantic and from Asia, from Asia, the other way. Uh, so there's it's a it's a blend and some meld. And what I practice is sort of global. Uh, I practice some. I use Chinese remedies and Indian remedies and uh, North American remedies. A lot of North American remedies. Yeah, yeah. And are there like a, a spice palette? Are there particular standout members of all those different families and, and cultural traditions that that are most prominent? Yeah, uh, I was brought up a lot on the North American traditions. That was a historical. Uh, the the, the post-industrial British, very interesting story. You know, uh, w w Britain did industrial revolution more than anybody else. And within a generation, the countryside had emptied and we were moving into Halifax and Bradford and Leeds and Manchester and so on in large numbers. And these were country people and they were more normally looking after themselves, mostly by women in the villages. They moved into black-to-back -back housing in, in, in the working class areas, proletariat, and they changed gender, the herbalists, and they, they were blokes who set up shops, the herbalist shops. One of the first was a man called Jesse Boot in Nottingham, 
who f- was the co-founder of the National Association of Medical Herbalists, well, Boots might have another connotation to you because that was he was originally a herbalist shop, mm. um, and that was the way it went. It was it was became a functional medicine for the working people, but they didn't have a, a, a legacy to fall back on. They just had polyglot, you know, village traditions. Along came an American who had rediscovered the principles of Greek medicine in the far in the Midwest. And it was all about hot and cold and using KN, and, which is a Native American remedy. Yeah. And so he came back with this new idea, Thompsonian medicine. No one's ever heard of it now. But it was the basis of a new tradition of herbal medicine as a profession in the, uh, in, in, in the, in, in, in the UK. And I inherited that tradition when I studied in Leicester in, in the 1970s. And so half of my uh, med- Materia Medica was North American. Mm. Echinacea, mm. you know, uh, the, the native ginseng, golden seal, and, and a lot of very exciting gynecological remedies come from North America. Mm. Well, let, let's let's talk about how we actually utilize some of these because we have access to, to all those different elements that you just mentioned, you know, cayenne, echinacea is very popular, obviously, ashwagandha, something that you asked me if I take, uh, took before here because we're at the, towards the end of the day, but I've still got a lot of energy, don't worry. Um, how does one approach uh, this huge encyclopedia of of medic of herbal remedies uh, when there's there's so much misinformation? There, there's so much you know varying quality. It's very hard to understand where to start. Do I start with a tea? Do I start with a tisane or a, a, a tincture? You know, a supplement. What what? How, how should we approach this? Well, the, one of the things that really attracts me to the herbal world is that these are ideal self care tools. Everybody can use them, and in the cultures that you uh, refer to, uh, everyone does use them. So an average Asian meal is full of medicines. We call them spices. Uh, And frankly, you can have them up to your ears and you won't be doing yourself any harm. We probably have a significant spice deficit in this country. Uh, and I always keep banging on about having more turmeric um, uh, because we know that these are very valuable medicinal agents. They increase blood flow, they increase digestive performance, almost certainly very important for the microbiome. And we're finding out all this stuff now and everyone was doing it without thinking about it, a bit like Emily, um, in, in, in the old days. Um, so the first thing I would say to anybody who's asking is start with your food. And uh, I work with Pucker now, and uh, we do teas uh, with lovely tasting teas. Uh, but they're also there. They were, they were designed as originally Ayurvedic formulas, uh, Indian formulas, to have that blend and to support a normal daily routine with herbs and things. So teas are a good place to start. They're gentle. Um, the dosing is not high, and you'll begin to understand that you can then do the Emily bit and say, oh, how does this feel to me? And if you don't like that one, you try another one. And most often, I don't know what's going to suit you. So I say, well, here's a few options. Try the peppermint or the chamomile or the fennel or whatever it is. See which one suits you. Ask yourself the question next morning, what was that like? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. And then so go we, from there. Start. Start with the small. Yeah. Um, build your confidence. Another uh, place I work with, which I strongly commend to anybody who wants to know about herbs, set up by the founder of Paco, Sebastian Pohl. It's called HerbalReality.com. Mm-hmm. If you want to know about what herb to use and when and how and how strong to use it, it's very. Uh, uh, accessible. You don't. It's not meant for professionals particularly. It's meant for anybody. You can just go up there and you can uh, and you can see the dosage regimes. You can see where to get it. You can see what makes sense, and it'll encourage you to taste it. Because, mm. like Emily, your tongue and your palate are a very good guide to what will suit you. Mm-hmm. And do you feel that herbal remedies can sit alongside pharmaceuticals? Or absolutely. Alongside? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And mm-hmm. most of my patients are on pharmaceuticals. Okay. And so we have to do the dance, mm-hmm. you know, and we're, we're not in the business of getting people off their prescriptions, but we can often get them to the point where they go back to their GP or whatever and say, you know what, I can, I think I don't need this anymore. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, and most often the doctor's delighted uh, <laughs> yeah. as long as they, the blood mark because uh, are stacking up and all the rest of it. Um, so we often provide a sort of support system for people who are on medication. 
uh, and most often we're dealing with things that the medication wasn't intended to deal with. Okay. Mm-hmm. You know, the other things that contribute almost certainly. I was doing a presentation yesterday on inflammation and herbs and uh, pointing out that most of the things that um, we access and, and from the herbal are missed by conventional anti-inflammatories. So they're working on you know, exposure at the gut level, exposure at the mouth level, um, various other factors that fire up inflammation which, are being, which can be treated quite accessibly. Yeah, with yeah. things like plants. Let's talk about inflammation and uh, herbal um, remedies because uh, inflammation, as we've talked about many times on this podcast, seems to be the root cause of a number of different issues. I think everyone uh, is aware of that these days. And if there are things that can enhan- enhance our inflammation balance, it stands to reason that it would be overall beneficial uh, uh, be- beneficial for, for a person. So what sort of herbs do you utilize in in that respect and and how do you further personalize it to to the individual the the the, we can start very simply with what we eat on the plate so uh, we're very interested in what we're calling phytonutrients which are the added value that many plants bring to the plate now we know about vitamins and minerals and so on Um, but there are many other things that plants produce which have value like polyphenols we call them or or the volatile oils the things that give the aroma and i'm working with pucker on this one again we're articulating a campaign to bring phytonutrients on the plate alongside fruit and vegetables as a value. One of the things about phytonutrients is they're colorful. So one of the quick is eat a rainbow every day because the reds and the blues and the yellows and the greens all denote different important pharmaceutical, pharmacological agents. So just eating a diversity of colors is a start. Um, spices are stacked full of these phytonutrients. So eat Asian, for heaven's sake. (laughs) You know, we've heard about the Mediterranean diet. Let's start eating Asian diet. And I'm personally convinced that, you know, in a world full of deprivation where it's difficult for many people to afford a healthy food, to have cooked lentils with turmeric a dal, maybe some spinach and potatoes, can save your life because of the spices. You don't need to spend, I mean, you know, how much does that cost? A few pennies. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, we, we don't need to spend a lot of money to eat healthily if you eat in an indigenous fashion, the same foods that people have always eaten, particularly in Asia. Um, and so, yes, I, we, I see that we can build on our plant knowledge very easily, simply at home, starting with the food that we eat. Yeah, yeah. Is there a collection of spices? You mentioned turmeric a couple of times. Is there a collection of spices that are like must-haves, do you think, in most people's cupboards that you could refer to? Yeah. A turmeric is a must-have. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. No, just end off that conversation. <laughs> you know, you can shoot me later, but no, turmeric has to be on your plate. It's almost ideally suited for the modern ills. It deals with so many issues, the blood sugar issues, the obesity issues, the uh, metabolic syndrome issues, the inflammatory issues for heaven's sake, Um, the gut microbiome issues are all, you know, on its plate. Mm -hmm. So turmeric definitely, cinnamon, Mm -hmm. as very much for the whole insulin resistance, the blood sugar metabolic syndrome issue, lots of evidence stacking up that it talks directly at that insulin resistance interface uh ginger is there a certain type of cinnamon that you recommend people vary as to which i my interest is uh, my my favorite is uh, is what we call sri lankan or um uh uh, ceylon cinnamon as well as or cinnamonum verum if you give it its latin name uh zeylanicum but the cassia from china and there's indonesian cinnamons as well and you'll find them all on the shelves but if you look if you buy the quills it's the one with the multiple quills that Mm -hmm. seem and you can smell them yeah emily do an emily (laughs) yeah you can you can immediately tell what is good uh ginger i mean you know just step back a bit it has been the most valuable commodity in human history, weight for weight. And you know what? It was made extinct in the wild 2,000 years ago 
All the ginger we've had since has had to be grown by rootstock because it's lost the capacity to live in the wild. And that's human. We were doing ecocide two, gen two millennia ago. Really? So valuable was ginger in people's mind because it's the antidote to cold and damp. And cold and damp were the main metaphors for infection. Mm. It's particularly lung and joint infection. So ginger was the go-to remedy for most sort of infections, mm. frankly. Mm. Uh, and we think we, we have a lot of it about, so let's use it. Mm. And a simple take-home remedy that I would offer anybody living in this benighted climate in the UK and during the winter when you get in the colds and the sniffles and you're feeling the cold and suddenly, you know, you, you get the cold in your kidneys uh, and, you know, uh-oh, something's coming along. Get some freshly ground ginger, powder some cinnamon, make a hot tea, sip it. And in fact, get a thermos flask, put that in there and keep sipping it through the day and you'll get instant healing. You'll feel your passages clearing and we know why that's happening. Simple home remedy. You're not going to kill yourself. You're not going to damage yourself, but it'll and you'll realize how fast these things can work. It's literally in minutes. So these are, you know, it's making what we're talking about here cheap and accessible and available to anybody really is my passion. Yeah, yeah. And the the, the full spectrum of spices out there, cumin, fennel seeds. Coriander, yeah. yeah. Cardamom. Cardamom's oh. huge, yeah. Yeah, yeah one yeah. of the best spices for recovery from co in convalescent care and when you're weak and enfeebled and, you know, can't eat very well and, you know, you, you need to build yourself up. Cardamom, Chinese were using it up to here, mm. very fond and of it in India. Yeah, yeah. So when, when as a strategy uh, uh, of trying to increase your polyphenol content, your phytochemical content, is is it a machine gun approach? Is it trying to get all those different ones on top of having a few sort of regular favorites like your yeah. turmeric, ginger, garlic? So yeah, you start with the shotgun approach, just have everything, <laughs> yeah. pile it on, yeah. uh, get a good cookbook in which they don't do this, but they, uh -huh. they don't sprinkle it on, they, they heat the spices yeah, on, good yeah. proper aromatic tastes. And then do the Emily thing. Try out a tea or a, 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 a spice on its own and, <laughs> you know, yeah. how does that feel? Yeah. And we sometimes divide people in the old times. They used to divide them into hot and cold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So there My mum always tells me about this. Yeah, she's well, always like, you're, you're too hot, you shouldn't have too much ginger. That's what yeah, she no, this, she, she's right as usual. <laughs> we, we, we don't argue with mum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but there is another side to it because sometimes you heat up because you're in a fever. Mm. And that's a defense measure against what people used to say was the cold. And so sometimes you need to support that. And so one of the standard ways of helping someone in a fever would be to warm them up with some ginger and cinnamon again. You know, uh, we went to uh, India um, so many years ago, my wife, and she'd just come out of a really deep bronchial infection. And we, th I promised her India would be wonderful, you know, lovely weather we hit a downpour and there was just damp coming down the walls and her bronchitis went really bad and ah. she was in this hotel in Delhi. We went downstairs, she was barely walking. There was a guy in a suit and, you know, a bit tucker behind this chrome and steel bar, obviously waiting for the party to start. And, you know, he was about 17 or 18, took one look at her and, his, and said, I know what you need. And he went and got the cocktail bar out and he ground fresh ginger fresh uh, black pepper and cinnamon and made a cocktail of it and gave it to her on me. Yeah. And I thought, this is saying a lot. This is a 17 year old street kid <laughs> yeah. who knew what she needed. Yeah. And it's, you know, it made the, all the difference. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? The whole warming up stuff when you have an illness, because we're, we're actually changing our opinion on the use of antipyretics. Um, in, uh, in common colds and, and fevers and, and virus and uh, viral illnesses. So the, the traditional sort of approach is you give antipyretics, you give paracetamol, you bring that fever down straight away. And whilst you need to be uh, careful, particularly in kids who are at risk of febrile convulsions, 
in a lot of cases, you might actually be prolonging the severity of your disease because the increase in temperature is actually a protective measure. So there's a few things that we're doing in medicine that I think we're coming around to a different way of thinking. And it's very in line with like things that my mum says actually, which is always quite amusing whenever we talk about it. <laughs> well, we talk a lot, or I talk a lot about fever management, uh -huh. which is just that, it's, it's, a, it's, it's incubating because at, 100, at 99 or 100, you've got three times the whack of your white blood cells. They're charging around crazy things and poor germ at that point. Yeah. And so you don't want to abort that. You don't want to stop that. You want to incubate it. Yeah. So it's all about keeping the temperature. And you can, we've got a thermometer, we can do this. So we cool, we let some of the sweat out and we, let, we cool it in simple ways and you can do it quite easily. Um, and then you let it break, the fever to break. Mm. And I've often said, one good fever, you're fixed. Mm. Because you've killed your first line, you know, yeah. your white blood cells are now, the, 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 the um, innate immunity is firing on now on all cylinders. Any germ that pokes its head in the door is going to get whacked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so a fever management, and it's sometimes about warming you up at that point, because you want to keep the temperature right. You don't want it to sink too prematurely. Uh, and people used to do this without too much advice. People instinctively understood yeah. this point. So we've talked about food. We talked about the inclusion of spices there as uh, the first line of uh, inflammation balance and, and, and defending against an, uh, uh, excess of inflammation. Um, we're about to move on to the specific herbal remedies. Yeah. Well, it depends on where we want to cut it. So mm -hmm. one of the main areas inflammation starts is actually in the lining of the blood vessels. So what we call the endothelium. And endothelial dysfunction has been implicated in most inflammation, as the startup of most inflammations. So a lot of the herbs and spices actually work there. So okay. all the spices I've mentioned, we have evidence to show that they work on that front line blood vessel wall. Uh, but there are many other herbs that we use in practice. I mean, you know, people have heard of ginkgo, for example. It, it's, that works specifically at blood vessel walls. Okay. And uh, we can go down the list of many of the remedies we use. Hawthorne, which we use very much for circulation and heart support, directly on the blood vessel walls and long list. Um, but you will get that from the colours. Yeah. So they will also work at that endothelial level. The spices definitely work. So that's one front line. The major front line, of course, is the gut wall, because we know that most of our inflammation, that the main challenge we have is in here, in the gut. And so we need, first of all, to look after our diet, and then we look at prebiotics and probiotics and various other ways of protecting our, what we increasingly now see as important guy down here called the microbiome make sure that's in good shape. Um, and sometimes after antibiotics, you need to support it in different ways. Uh, but there are again, many herbs that we know and have evidence for, and you know what they are? Turmeric, ginger, <laughs> cinnamon, you know, yeah. I keep coming back around, yeah, it's yeah. like a stuck record. Yeah. Um, are there any others that oh, yeah, perhaps- Oh yeah, too, almost too many to list, but uh, we use a lot of mucilages, for example. Okay. So if you heard of gum arabic, that's a classic remedy for healing the gut. Slippery elm is another one that people have used from North America. Um, the tannins, you know, tannins are the things you make leather with, you know, so you, they basically curdle or coagulate protein and you make leather out of it from soft tissues. Um, if you swallow tannins, which could be a strong black tea, but there are many other herbs that deliver them more accurately than that. You will uh, uh, temporarily leatherize, if you like, the lining of your upper stomach and that will reduce inflammatory activity. So anything that comes from up here and the gullet and the stomach uh, can be reached directly with the appropriate uh, tannin-containing herbs. So Metasweet was a good example of one of those that would we use a lot for healing at the stomach level. But here's the thing, Metasweet is where aspirin come, came from. The old name for Metasweet was Spirea. And there was a German chemist who was wandering down the riverbank one day trying to find an alternative to the, the stuff from willow bark, salicylic acid, which works very well to reduce inflammation, but drills holes in your stomach. And he was looking for a gentler way of doing it. And he picked up, he saw the Metasweet on the riverbank and he smelt it and realized it was, it was wintergreen smell, you know, it's, it's salicylate. 
And a little idea came because he knew that Metasweet was used for healing the stomach. Right. So he went and synthesized what we now call a spirea, yeah. aspirin, yeah, yeah. specifically because he thought that that would be um, gentle on the stomach. He was wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the Metasweet from which he got it actually has tannins and mucilages in it, which probably protect oh. the gut and allows you to have a modicum of aspirin without the damage to the stomach. So this is the sort That's of magic we, we, yeah. we play with. Yeah, yeah. yeah. A, a, any others? I've, I've heard of, uh, of uh, lemon balm, uh, uh, peppermint. Um, uh, what other sort of... Uh... Uh, well, those are both great because you can make them as teas. Mm. And they, uh, peppermint is a good example of what I was saying earlier about hot and cold because most of the spices are warming. And I don't know usually to start with. I can sometimes tell a bit from looking at the tongue and so on, but I don't know which is going to suit any particular person. So I'll simply say, here's some fennel or here's some ginger and here's some peppermint. You tell me which you feel better with because peppermint is cooling. Fennel is warming. Ginger is warming. Chamomile is sort of cooling. So you can choose. Do an Emily, you know, just pick the one that you feel good with the next day yeah. and then go from there and then you can stack it up if you find that peppermint is helpful there are other cooling things you can use we call them bitters yeah. uh, which are one of the you know people associate with herbs they taste awful yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah yeah but there's some that are really effective as bitters dandelion is a very simple one uh -huh. uh, but we can go right through to wormwood which you you know uh, the the, the uh, french for wormwood is vermouth so you know it's, it's one of those cultural things coffee black coffee without the sugar that's a bitter. And you, those are cooling and have always been understood all the way around the world. They cool down heat. Mm. And so in innately are anti-inflammatory. And they do that mostly by working at the gut level. Yeah. You mentioned, um, we were talking earlier about using teas and, and, that, and um, that sort of like first level of like how to test what works for you. What are the next sort of stage, what are the next steps in terms of how do you in slowly increase the dose? And, is it that sort of activity that you would recommend doing alongside a medical herbalist? Yeah, so I, I, I'm all for giving people tools for doing it themselves. Yeah. You, I see medical herbalists as the guys you turn to when you f can't figure it out. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And, you want and this a bit is more. a very extensive field. I, I, yeah. I wouldn't be able to figure out myself even. So you start at the beginning. You start with the teas, answer the question, was it the mint or was it the ginger that you liked? because that'll set you down a particular path. If the mint, you can start with a few bitters. If it's the warming that you need, and there's all the spices to go for. Then if you think I'd like some more turmeric, but I don't want curry for breakfast, which is, you know, what you have in India, you have curry every, oh, day, every curry meal of the day. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but you don't want to do that. Then you take a turmeric supplement uh -huh. and you can go and check those out. And places like Herbal Reality, you can find out where what the dosage you can aim for and where, where to go you know what what you need to get uh and then as you get more and more intrigued and particularly as you're getting the feedback here you can say oh i'll go and consult a, someone who knows about this stuff and go mm. and consult a herbal practitioner mm. so the stitches along the way yeah um in building my app uh where we're, we're we've created a selection of recipes that we're constantly building uh the library of and um you can field your according to health goals. Uh, we've also got a nutritional section, which looks at the, the traditional nutritionals of, you know, your, your macros, your micronutrients. What's really lacking that like we were talking about earlier is this understanding of phytochemicals and the indices that represent how phytonutrient rich this particular recipe is owing to the herbs, the spices, the specific vegetables you're using. You're working on something, am Just I right? Like in that. terms of yeah, T yeah tell we me want to build a, um, a, a we want a, a campaign. We're, we're sort of re this is Pucker now, mm. uh, recruiting stakeholders and other people around the idea that we we, we got our plate, you know, the, the our healthy plate with its fruit and vegetables and its fish and so on. We think that there's something we can add to that. Uh, which we're calling herbs and spices, simple. Most people think of herbs and spices as flavorings. We want to change the view that they're not, they're more than flavorings. They are actually health promoting. And they, because they provide these chemicals, these phytonutrients, and we can put chapter and verse to it. We can actually show health outcomes that link to these things. We want to build that case and to get a campaign because it's cheap. 
You know, we have health inequalities. You know, we talk about the five a day, but about 15% of the people of the population do five a day. The other 85% nowhere near it. How do we get them a little healthier without them having to raid their piggy bank? Mm -hmm. And the answer is, one answer is, to get more spices into yeah. their diet, more herbs. So yes, it's right, hits right what we want to see in the public interest. Yeah, absolutely. Because there wasn't an appreciation for that nutrient density uh, because most nutritional profiles just don't represent, you know, how healthy it is to have three different teaspoons of different spices that you're using. And we can so easily put that right with a mm. bit of bit of work. Yeah. And well, turn it into a very accessible. I, I want a little badge saying, you know, uh, herbs and spices are good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's leave it at that. Yeah. 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 You, you've got a lot of um, uh, papers and reviews on on, your, on the website. You, you, you're part of the Re Herbal Relief, I think. Herbal Reality. Herbal yeah. Reality, that. Yeah. Herbalreality.com. Um, do you use Phenol Explorer and a lot of those sites to look at the de the, the phytochemical profiles? We, we are ingredients? building those. We are putting those things together. Brilliant. So yeah. we want to create a a a, 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 a reference point mm. to show what it if if it's a teaspoon, you know how much you're adding to. Yeah. You know, what 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 value does that do? What value does having a herbal tea? Have yes. In yeah. terms of it's adding to your yeah. daily intake. So yeah. we want to quantify that. So we are right as we we speak yeah. on that journey. Yeah, that would be amazing because yeah. I think a lot more people are becoming more appreciative of plant points in general, you know, uh, the diversity of the ingredients that you have on a weekly basis. 30 is the ideal number and spices account for a quarter of it. So we're sort of moving in the right direction, but I think there's a lot more we can do by making it a lot more um, obvious about how nutrient dense a meal is just through the addition of a few different spices. Yeah, and, and on that note, um, in an ideal scenario, uh, what sort of quality of spices are we looking for? What what represents a, a high quality spice? Whereas where something, uh, whereas you know, compared to another spice that might not you know have the same amount of phytochemicals in. There are there are various ways in which you can reduce the quality of the spices let's start that way okay yeah um, uh, once you powder something it's beginning to oxidize it's beginning to lose its aromatics mm -hmm. so i always suggest first of all if you're buying for yourself go for things like cumin and coriander and so on go for the actual whole seeds and get a mill or grinder or spice mill or something to grind them fresh and you'll notice the difference i mean the aromas are wonderful aren't they um if you are buying powders, and this is a trick we all know in the supermarket, when you see the little bottles, go for the back for the longest <laughs> sell-by date because the, the, don't buy something that's been sitting on a shelf for six months. That's yeah. what I'm saying because you're yeah. going to lose a lot of quality. Yeah. Um, as Pucker, we obviously make a great strong point about growing organically because we want a to grow sustainably, but B, we know that plants grown organically are higher in phytochemicals and phytonutrients. And there's an absolutely obvious reason for that because most of them are produced by plants for their own defense. They're adapting to the climate change and uh, climate uh, stresses and insects and so on. If a plant's being sprayed with pesticides and so on, it doesn't need to produce those phytochemicals. So we know that organically grown has a much higher stack of those phytonutrients. Yeah. So we make a point of that, but of course it's more expensive. Uh, but go for a reliable supplier. Don't go down to some bin end at the end of the road. Just find someone who's got a reputation to protect, who will uh, more likely to provide you with the quality that you need. Yeah, brilliant. Um, personal question. Uh, I'm about to go on my stag soon. And as you can imagine, uh, I've racked up quite a bit of bad karma along the last couple of decades with my friends. I'm going to be drinking alcohol, uh, hopefully not too much, but I'm probably going to need some support. So uh, considering I'm generally pretty healthy, I generally sleep well, uh, are there particular medical herbs you think I should include in my self-care kit whilst I'm away? You should, <laughs> uh, especially if we go into a hot and steamy climate, <laughs> yeah. um, because this is where the bitters come into their own. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, they are primarily liver remedies. 
I mean, that's how you can distill a lot of stuff, that they work on basically getting their liver working better for you. So they make themselves ideal hangover cures. So start with dandelion. There's another remedy that the French are very fond of called artichoke leaf, which you can get. Uh, but any bitter uh, can be used. And the m more hot and steamy it gets, the more they're effective because they're cooling and drying. So they're anti So if you if if the result of having too much alcohol is you feel hot and steamy and you want to loosen your collar, yeah. that's when you need the bitters. Okay. Uh, wormwood is another one. Uh, you know, the, and you can buy them. You know, especially in in, in airport duty free, they can buy these little bottles of bitters that you're meant to take after you've been out for a party. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh -huh. So artichoke leaf. Wormwood, wormwood, and, yeah. uh, dandelion, okay, uh, gentian, yeah. uh, root. Uh, if you if you buy these bitters, you know they call them bitters. Yeah, uh, you'll see a long list of basically spices, but a lot of these bitter herbs as well. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, that would be my stack for a stag. Okay. Would be a, a bottle or two of those bitters. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna stock up on those yeah. before I go. <laughs> this has been brilliant. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And your website is fantastic. We're gonna do a deep dive into. Uh, some of the other topics that we haven't uh, had enough time to talk into, like the chronic illness uh, uh, and uh, the ways in which you can support that with medical herbs. So that's brilliant. You know, look forward to that because that's what we do most of our working day is yeah, working yeah. with people with chronic illnesses. Yeah, yeah, I can definitely get behind that uh, that campaign as well to get spices on the plate. We'll call on you, Rufi, because <laughs> we'll be looking for everybody who can broadcast this absolutely. as widely as we can. It's uh, such an easy target. It's such an easy message. Yeah, absolutely. Eat Thank you so much. Rupi. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> if you enjoyed that video, you'll love the library of content that we have on doctorskitchen.com. Make sure you hit subscribe and we have podcasts in our library on brain health, well-being, supplements and lots more. Have a wonderful day.